So I remember that Arthur Jones would say, you know, that, you know, a, a full body Nautilus workout will take care of everything. Cardiovascular, flexibility, uh, uh, everything. I, I, I don't agree with that. Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high-intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co-author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years experience training clients and has supervised over 15,000 high-intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course. So, this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I U-N-I, dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support. Hi guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior. This podcast teaches you how to optimize your high intensity training protocol and your hit business to help you achieve your health, fitness and business goals. I've interviewed many of the top experts in high intensity training and high intensity training business, including David Landau, Tim Ryan, Ryan Hall, Andrew Short, Dr. Doug McGuff, Skylar Tanner, Drew Bay, Noah Kagan, Luke Carlson, Mark Sisson, etc, etc. This episode is a little bit of an experiment. My guest is Richard Chartrand. Richard is not a trainer. He does not own a big health and fitness business, but he is a student of HIT and has been a HIT proponent for over 35 years. Richard was featured in Holiday Thanks, a popular article written by Dr. Doug McGuff in 2009, which explains how Richard may have single-handedly revitalized the HIT movement with his amazing physical transformation following cardiac surgery. Some of you have been asking for an interview with a trainee for some time. Richard shares what he has learned in his pursuit of optimal health and fitness. And I think many of you will find this very interesting and useful. I certainly did. Richard tells the story of his inspiring training journey and the severe health scares which inspired him to pursue a short bodybuilding career. He talks about his, how his training protocol has evolved, how he wants to prove John Little wrong, and much, much more. For all of the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. And don't wait, don't wait, don't forget to wait around at the end to find out how you can get something awesome. And now I give you Richard Chartrand. So Richard, welcome to the show. Welcome to Corporate Warrior. I appreciate you taking the time to join me. Uh, this evening where I am, but where you are, I'm, it's in Toronto, isn't it? So was it kind yeah. of early afternoon for you, I assume? Something like that? Yeah, I think it's yeah. about two right now. Okay. So uh, you obviously have a, a really fascinating story um, where you had you know health scare back in 2003 and then um, obviously that uh, culminated in a uh, free vessel coronary bypass in 2007 and which I believe was a bit of a wake-up call for you um, and then obviously there was a, a kind of a radical health transformation that followed so would you be able to kind of I guess tell me the story of how that all came to pass and then what happened in terms of 
you know, exercise and lifestyle changes thereafter? Well, well, um, just a, a couple of things is even before the, the, the I had a minor heart attack it was actually 2001. Doc, Doug McGuff had a uh, just the dates wrong in his article. And then, of course, the bypass surgery was in 2007. But even before I've been working out. Uh, since about 1980, 1981, and I've been working out primarily hit style uh, since probably 83, 84, since then. So uh, the heart attack, of course, came as a surprise. Uh, well, I guess it comes as a surprise to everyone. But, uh, you know, I, was, I, I had bought into the idea that as a fitness buff, I was invincible which is something I, I have some opinions on. You saw that in my uh, in the blog post that I sent you. Mm -hmm. uh, so it came as a surprise. And, of course, uh, uh, I was told in 2001 that because I was quite fit, that one of the reasons why my heart attack had been mild, I have a, a family history of heart disease with several of my uh, uncles and or grandparents, uh, my grandfather dying in their 40s from heart disease. Um, but, uh, I was told that because I had been, uh, fit that, you know, one, and of course, this is just speculation on the part of the nurse, but that your, your heart will develop collateral circulation as a result of fitness activities, which basically means that other than the main arteries, there's a number of other arteries that, that form smaller arteries. So if one of your arteries becomes blocked. Uh, causing a heart attack, because you have some collateral circulation, the blockage may not be as severe as it might be for somebody else. And as a result, it wouldn't cause, um, uh, you know, you won't die or have severe heart damage as a result, because my heart damage was actually quite, uh, quite, quite minor. Uh, and the last time I saw a cardiologist, he actually told me that, that he saw none. Uh, so whatever he said, whatever little you may have had seems to have, 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 you know, regenerated itself for lack of a better term. And so for the next six years, I continued to work out. Interestingly, they had told me that I had a blockage, but they didn't think they needed to have any uh, surgical um, uh, need, at, you know, process done at that time. But they did tell me that I could expect to have uh, angina with certain activities. Interestingly, I never got angina. Well, I shouldn't say never. There was once. I'll tell you a little bit more story. I never got angina when I did HIT. And if you know, you know, uh, Doug McGuff's, uh, you know, theory, theorizing about venous return mm -hmm. and how, you know, a, a leg press done properly is probably a lot safer for a cardiac person than walking or jogging. Uh, because of the venous return that, that actually helps. That had been my experience because uh, when I would get angina primarily was because if I walked at a fast pace or my wife and I do ballroom dancing. And uh, if I was to go to a dance and the first couple dances would be, uh, you know, like a jive or a quick step or something like that. I sometimes would have to say, okay, I need to sit down a bit, almost like I needed to warm up the car well before I, uh, you know, really turn up the motor and idle too high. So if I started with fast dances, I would get angina. It was very predictable. And I, uh, and I would get um, uh, some chest pain. I would sit down and then it would go in and I'd be good for the rest of the night. Whereas if on the other hand, I um, just started with slow dances and warmed up properly. I could dance all night long and not have a problem. Uh, so at that time, I, I quit playing hockey for reasons that I, I didn't feel safe on the ice, but I continued to work and strength train. And then six years later, I did have an episode. And that time, I, I, I did get chest pain during a, a, a workout, which prompted me to uh, go see a cardiologist who sent me for further tests. It was kind of interesting because I went to a, 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 a hospital that specializes in cardiac situations and they ran a bunch of tests on me, uh, ECGs and, and various things and, and stress ECGs on the treadmill and things like that. And I had been scheduled to go in and also have an angiogram where they go in and pump chemicals through you where they can visually see 
I guess, radioactive things through a, like an x-ray and see if you have blockage. And the day before I had it, they said, um, uh, you know, you're scheduled for it, so we're going to make you do it. But based on your performance on the treadmill and what we're seeing on the ECG, we, we, we don't think we're going to find anything because you did so well on those things, which is sort of another topic is I think sometimes fitness can, can mask certain health issues. But anyways, the next day, uh, I've already made the short story long, so it's too late for that. Um, no, that's fine. Uh, the angiogram did show uh, three blockages. And, uh, and, and that was at that time where I, I was told uh, by the uh, surgeon, you could probably go on and, and live most of your life and possibly never have a problem. And he said, but he said, in 20 years from now, if you did have a problem, right now, if we were going to do uh, bypass surgery, it would be relatively low risk because you're young and you're otherwise healthy and fit. But he says, if you had, and you might never have a problem, uh, other than, like I say, I had predictable angina, but it was manageable because I just had to alter my lifestyle and avoid you know, certain things. Um, but he says, if in 20 years from now it does develop into further problems, then the surgery could be higher risk then because you'd be older, et cetera, et cetera. So I asked him, I said, um, what would you do if you were me? And he said, if I was you, I, I, I would have the surgery. And so I said, OK, well, let's do it. So I was put on a list and I, I had a list for what was called elective bypass surgery, which if ever there was an oxymoron, um, but it was elective, meaning that it was an emergency or anything like that. I waited in a waiting list for eight months, and then I had it done. And and then, of course, by then I was 47 or 48 years old. And so I set a goal for myself to be in the best shape of my life. Just to – sorry, just to interrupt you quickly, Richard. Um, how – what was your – so was your physical health – um, how was your physical health just prior to that operation? I was working out. Well, physical health. I mean, the answer the answer health. I mean, I I I had have uh, cardiac, uh, you know, heart disease, right? Yeah. Uh, but as far as symptoms and whatnot, uh, I was. I think the word is asymptomatic. I mean, I was working out right until the week before my cardiac surgery yeah right so and you know like i say i i didn't make adjustments for certain thing i didn't play hockey which i which i do now and as you know if i was going to walk or do things i made sure that you know brisk walking or ballroom dancing and start with slow dances but other than that i was asymptomatic and 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 not unhealthy in hindsight, I was probably heavier than I should be, and that was, you know, I tell you about the the, uh, the bodybuilding experience that came after. Yeah, I learned, I got another perspective on what it means to be lean or not lean. Uh, but but other than that, no. To answer your question, you know, I fit. I was fit, but I'm not going to say I was healthy because I was on a waiting list for bypass surgery. Yeah, it's. Uh, I know it's a. Uh, it's difficult to answer because. The definition of health is uh, a, st a strange one, and I get I get w what you're saying. Um, I guess I was just trying to understand because because I think well I've I've misunderstood something here. I thought that actually I didn't realize that you had a history of heart disease in your family. Um, so you know, regardless of obviously your physical activity and your diet and lifestyle, you know, you are obviously at risk. Um, you were at risk of a heart attack uh so it's just yeah so i've just kind of realized that as you've been talking that i kind of had that a bit a bit wrong so um but sorry please go on and i know you were getting into your lifestyle uh, i mean yeah. i mean some other things I, i'm also uh in a, in a couple of months in november i will be clean and sober for 26 years huh. so in my youth uh let's just leave it at that i had part of my youth was misguided and uh, fitness activities and getting into fitness as exercise is part of the reason that led me to uh, 
a more healthy lifestyle because as one person put it to me a long time ago, he says, you're building a house in the daytime and you're tearing it down at night. So, you know, my sort of rock and roll lifestyle and fitness didn't, you know, it was, it was incong incongruent. And so that's one of the things that eventually led me to, to, you know, become clean and sober. So no doubt that uh, family history and even um, I was in a mad marriage for 11 years where we spent a lot of time angry. And I theorize that when you spend a lot of time angry, you're, you're creating a lot of cortisol. And I think that that even could be a factor. In it. But of course, this is all speculation on my part. The truth is that, you know, it, it's really hard to pinpoint. Somebody has a heart attack or doesn't have it and why they did or didn't is really up for, you know, anybody's guess, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so when I did decide to, you know, be in the best shape of my life, by the time I was 50, I shared that when I was up having a phone call one day with Josh Trentini, who I'm guessing you know or know of. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar. So Josh said, uh, well, if you're serious about that, you should enter a bodybuilding contest. And I, and of course, laughed because I said, you know, I'm an ectomorph. Uh, you know, that would be really hilarious for me to be in a, you know, guys who enter bodybuilding contests are guys with big muscles. And, you know, he pointed out to me that in the natural bodybuilding world, that was not necessarily uh, the case. And, uh, and said, who cares if you win or not anyways? He says, if you want to be in the best shape of your life, that gives you a target and gives you a, a time and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, to shoot for. So I went ahead and, and, and made that commitment, uh, which I'm, I'm glad I, I took it off my bucket list, if you will. I, I would not be eager to do it again. Um, but it was a neat experience to have had. So, you know, and I remember going back to leanness where Josh said, I said, you know, how lean do you have to be to have, he says, he says, most people, if you ask them how lean they need to be to have really visible abs, they'll give you a number. And then he says, if you subtract 10 pounds from the number they give you, they're starting to get close. So that's why, you know, when I started this, I was 198 pounds at a height of six feet. When I competed, I was 163 pounds. So obviously, I was not, you know, a carrying tons of muscle, but I did okay because, you know, I was lean. So a big part of bodybuilding, is, it, there's a fair amount of illusion in bodybuilding. Uh, people learn to present themselves in the, in the best possible light. Uh, one, from being as lean as possible. Second, from applying multiple coats of tanning and even things to, to shine in, in oiling themselves and in, in posing. I got a posing coach and posing is all about bringing out your best parts and hiding all your weak spots and, and making everything look, look good. So there's a fair amount of illusion uh, in bodybuilding. Sometimes if you stood next to uh, a natural bodybuilder that looked really good on stage and you stood right up next to him when he, and you might say, Oh, you might be a little surprised to go, He's not nearly as big as I thought he was when I saw him on stage because there's a, a fair amount of illusion that's involved with that. Yeah. So what did your – when you decided to get in the best shape of your life, what did the what did the regimen look like? Uh, well, frankly, I mean my – it was pretty standard hit uh, routines uh, once or twice a week. Uh, you know, seven or eight exercise, you know, the, the things that you and most of your viewers are, are familiar with. As a matter of fact, I think for most of it, come to think of it, because we're going back 10 years now, most of it I was only working out once a week. Uh, and it was just one full body workout a week. Uh, the biggest thing by far was diet and, uh, you know, losing all that fat so that I could show the muscle that I did have. I'm not sure. And of course, one of the things I did this morning is I was at, uh, um, help me out here. You interviewed him just a, a little while ago. I'm having a mental block. 
Uh, he has the, the facility, Blair Wilson. Oh, yeah. So I actually had, I precision just finished fitness, a workout I with uh, Blair Wilson. Precision Blair Fitness. This morning, right? And, oh, okay. And one of the reasons that attracts me, he just bought a, a machine from me and we met. And, uh, and I want to use his Bod Pod uh, machine over time. I have my own equipment, but I, I want to go there once a month and have him train me. But also, I want to use the Bod Pod because one of my. Um, one of my goals is to prove uh, John Little wrong about, you know, whether or not you can actually gain muscle after, you know, you've trained for a certain amount. I'll come back to that. And he may well be right, but I think it's important that all of us try to prove him wrong. Um, Why do you want to prove anyways, him wrong? What's that? Why do you want to prove him wrong? Well, uh, the, well I, I shouldn't say that I want to prove him wrong, <laughs> although I'd be delighted to. <laughs> as I'm sure you would, but I just think that uh, it can be self-defeating, although I'm sure that what, when he, what he speaks of uh, is probably, you know, he's got good reasons and his experience and he's trained far more people, but I just think that if you psychologically in your workout start off with the idea, well, I've been training now for X number of years, so I've gained all the muscle I can ever gain and I just have to um, realize that I'm never going to gain any more. Well, I think it could become a very self-fulfilling prophecy. It might even go the other way. Whereas if you're continually looking to find ways to build, you know, with proper perspective, mm. meaning that, you know, you don't start to be obsessive about it or, or, or you know, start having uh, self-esteem issues and or take steroids in the worst case scenario or, or things like that. But if you're continually looking for it, I mean, could it make a difference? Could you gain a pound a year or as a 58 year old guy, uh, could sar sarcopenia, if I'm pronouncing that properly, yeah. uh, you know, could you, and I don't know, number is maybe instead of losing a pound a year or half a pound a year, you don't lose any or maybe even gain a half a pound a year. But I think that you have to say, cause, cause John, it, it, I think is based his logic on the way he works out and the way he does things and whatnot. But I think there's 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 various ways that I would like to experiment to see if there's you know maybe things that he hasn't considered or hasn't thought of. What sort of things do you think he may not have considered, and what are you looking to experiment with? Well, I think uh, even though uh, I disagree with much of what Brian Johnson um, talked about in your recent interview. Mm -hmm. I think that the idea of, of freestyling and sense of not getting overly caught up with the weight and the time under load, but really going for, you know, a certain feel, I think there's something to that. I'm also planning on experimenting uh, with uh, fasting, not just intermittent fasting, but I know it, uh, two of the people that I like listening to are Chris Master John and Rhonda Patrick, if you've ever listened to their podcast. Yeah. So uh, on, uh, uh, Rhonda Patrick recently interviewed a fella whose name is going to escape me, but he's talking about, you know, longer term fasting, like five day fasting and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'll mispronounce this word, but autophagy. That's, yeah, is, autophagy or, yeah. Yeah, and so technically, you know, if you do three or four uh, uh, fasts, five-day fasts in a given year, for example, that, and he says it's not the fast itself, but as you, you have some of these cells be, um, you know, die natural death and it's reproduced, you know, he's, he's speculating that you could literally sort of uh, have a new immune system after doing that a few times. Well, I think immune, your immune system and your re ability to recover from workouts are, are closely, if not actual, directly related. So part of me wonders, you know, if you could do that sort of thing, um, would that be something that would renew your ability to actually put on muscle. Uh, the, the other thing that I, I think is 
uh, when people look at you know any kind of uh, conclusions, scientific or otherwise, as far as what people can or can't do, um, what I think about is most people in our society are chronically sleep deprived. And so as a result of that, you know, most experiments that are being done, it's very hard to say, well, let's find a population that's not sleep deprived and let's see how they respond to exercise and see if they can have greater frequency or greater volume. Because very few people are actually getting enough sleep. And and most people are are, uh, are, are sedentary between workouts and are eating a lot of junk. I find it interesting that often you see guys in prison who uh, get really big. Now, in prison, I'm sure they get steroids because they get lots of drugs in prison because I know I've done volunteer work in prisons in the past. And apparently, there's more drugs in prison than there is on the street. But, but, And I'm sure that applies to steroids as well. And I remember having this conversation with Doug McGuff in the past, and he speculated also that the prison population probably has a higher testosterone level than uh, the general population, and that could be a factor. But, you know, all that notwithstanding, all these guys do is train, eat, and sleep. So most of us don't have the, I hesitate to use the word luxury, but most of us have other uh, obligations that don't allow us to do that and whatnot. So I, I think that there could be things that John Little hasn't considered uh, in terms of what might be possible. So there's just things I've ordered. uh, There's a fasting mimicking supplements that the fellow that Ron and Patrick ordered so that you don't actually fast for five days, but you take various supplements and you go on a very low uh, uh, calorie diet for five days. But the idea is that in his experiments, he's shown that the effects are virtually identical to an actual fast. So, I'm going to give that a shot and get do three times and see what that might do. But whatever you do, whether it's freestyling Brian Johnson or, or, or some of the things I'm talking about, I think we should all be still trying to, again, with proper perspective, prove John Little wrong. Uh, because if we just simply accept it, then you know it could become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, and there's nothing lost by trying. Because if the worst case scenario is you maintain what you got and it keeps things interesting, well, then nothing wrong with that. Yeah, no, I do. I do agree. Um, so just, just to elaborate on your protocol that you did following the, you know, the surgery, um, was that, so that was, I just want to, just for the listeners more than anything, um, was that single set to failure, moving quickly between two different exercises, uh, and like you said, seven to eight or five to eight exercises within one workout? Is that Yeah, I own own, uh, six Nautilus machines. Uh, So I had a leg press and a pull down, uh, torso arm, I guess the official name, and a decline press, uh, a low back, and a... um, and a, and a decline presser. Did I name them? Did I name one twice there? But anyways, those. And I also had uh, dip. I did dips. I did some dumbbell work. And I did do. Uh, I was. I had a trap bar, and I was doing trap bar deadlifts. So everything was pretty much single set to failure. Not necessarily all super slow. There might have been, you know, uh, J reps or stage reps in there as well. Uh, but with the. Um, with the trap bar, I was kind of mimicking, you know, the old 20 rep squat uh, routines where you, you pick a weight and you do 10 reps and then, you know, you take a few breaths and then do five and take a few breaths and do three and then two and then finally one. So I was doing that with the uh, trap bar, sort of mimicking, except, of course, with the old 20 rep squats, you're not actually um racking the bar you're just kind of standing there and and doing uh taking those deep breaths you know the old breathing squat stuff from randall strassen and super squats books um so i was mimicking that with the with the trap bar deadlifts only i would actually obviously you know take the bar and and uh, put it down and, and walk around a bit catch my breath and do a few more but other than that it was is Pretty, I guess you call that rest pause as well. 
Um, but other than that, just typical, yeah, one set to failure. How did you first get into high intensity training? Did you was your first introduction to exercise traditional weightlifting? You know, how did how did you get introduced to, to high intensity training? I I, I, not, I first read a book by Kenneth Cooper called Aerobics, and I don't know if you're familiar with it or for yeah. your readers. Uh, you know, he had a point system where various steady state activity would give you so many points. And the goal was to get 30 points a week. And the implication was that if you got more, the more you got, the better you got. So I started to do that, everything from jogging, swimming, uh, playing hockey and whatnot. And then I started going to the gym and doing strength training in between. So I was pretty much, I was working out every day. And, and, uh, and, and my workouts in the gym was more... It was multiple sets, certainly wasn't, uh, it was still like three times a week, which was a lot considering all the other stuff I was doing on the side. You know, like I would jog to the gym, do a workout and jog home uh, or, you know, go swim laps for an hour at the pool and then go do a workout and then jog home. Uh, and, and then I read, uh, I don't remember how I came to read it, but I read the Nautilus bodybuilding book by Ellington Darden. Uh, since then I've read pretty much everything he's ever written uh, and, and what struck me about that is that most all the other things I had read um, seemed to be very um, uh, random and, and arbitrary it was like do this, just do it didn't say why and I was struck by that book that Archer Jones thinking he wouldn't just say do this because you know Arnold did it. He would say do this because you know you know go to failure because you need to do this. Yeah. Train briefly because you know you can train hard or you can train uh, you can train long or hard, but you can't do both. And train infrequently because you need to recover. So I was struck by the logic of it and that it was a logical approach. I mean, since then there's some things. That, that I think Arthur Jones, I think, is a genius and, 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 and you know, to this day, he continues to be vindicated for many of what he's saying, much of what he's saying. Other things, I think he might have, you know, these things evolve. And I think there's other things that I wouldn't necessarily agree with him on. What is your, what is your current exercise regimen look like? Uh, well, I, I'm going to start out by mentioning that I play hockey once a week. I don't think of that as as a, a, my exercise program, but I recognize that it does have an exercise effect. And I also recognize that it does interfere with my recovery ability. So to leave it out, uh, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't give the full picture. So, you know, Ken Hutchins would say exercise versus recreation. That would be recreation. Uh, although I think that, you know, uh, hockey was – High intensity interval training before it was cool. And you play basketball. I would say it's very similar too. Yeah. To that, uh, probably basketball is even worse. You don't even get to glide on the skates. You're always running. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, but other than that, I usually do one uh, weekly uh, full body workout. Uh, the most I will do is usually seven sets. Sometimes it might be four or five sets. And occasionally during the week, uh, I'll do push-ups. One of my one of my goals, just for I don't know if it's ego or, or whatever you want to call it, is is to be able to do 15 dips and 15 chins uh, with my body weight. And this is not like 10 seconds up or 10 seconds down, relatively strictly. But I just think as a guy who's approaching 60, uh, that I want to be able to do that. So. And, and, and to do 25 strict push-ups. And you, so you can do those I'll, currently, can you? Uh, I, well, I, to do, I have that done those recently. I found that there's a skill, uh, definitely a skill factor to that, that when I do it regularly, I get to my 15 uh, or 25. And then when I get away from it uh, and then I try it again, it goes less, even though um, – my strength training is still being done. So I think there's a skill acquisition to that. Yeah. But I have hit all those and, and 
but there's a certain amount of practice and skill with that, without question. So how old are you now, if you don't mind asking? I'm 58. I'll be 59 in November. Excellent. Yes. It's uh, it's always inspiring to you know to hear to hear people continuing this type of training for a, for a long period of time. Um, so it's just interesting to get your view on something. I recently interviewed um, Dr. James Steele for the third time, and you know we discussed his view that there's a lack of evidence that shows as you get stronger you need more recovery time and a number of my some of my guests have are exploring the idea of actually increasing training frequency um which th there's one study which came from i think jeremy lenarchy's group and um, which suggests that maybe greater hypertrophy can come for advanced trainees with increased frequency, which obviously flies in the face of a lot of the um, advice coming from the kind of traditional hit community. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Have you dug into any of that literature at all or, or heard that point of view? Um, well, I mean, what I would say is I think that um, the hit community at one point uh, went overboard and, and you know, the idea with, you know, okay, you got to work out and in between workouts, you know, if you, if you can, if you can sit, don't stand, if you're going to lay down, it's even better and do almost nothing, you know, in between your workouts. And I remember, you know, Doug McGuff talked about, you know, chastising people because they'd heard that, oh my God, you, you, you you took up cycling and you can't take up cycling because all your gains will be will be negated and whatnot and and then doug later said you know as people get fit they naturally want to be more active and and do more things and i think that uh a certain amount of activity is actually beneficial for your recovery because i, I think and and i in the blog post that i sent you um i think that being completely still is bad for you. I think that we need to move around, not necessarily strenuous, but I think we need to move around on a regular basis every day. Uh, I think we're made to do that. So I, I think that, you know, the, the thing about the question is, you know, do you do, say you're doing 12 exercises once a week, would you be better off doing four exercises three times a week which would be more frequency, going back to your question, or do 12 exercises three times a week? All I can say is um, there's definitely a limit to how much you can do. But I also think that if we were so fragile that, you know, oh, my God, if you work out an extra workout or an extra frequency, or, you know, all your gains are going to go away and you're not going to do things, we never would have survived as a species. Um the other thing I would think is, and, and this is somewhere I, I have to give credit to Brian Johnson, is it's it's thought of as, as linear. In other words, maybe, you know, for three months, a person would work out, you know, three, four, five times a week. And then after that, take, you know, a whole month off. And then for a while, do, you know, a month uh, of, or, or two months of once a week or once every 10 days. I think it varies from person to person. I guess I'm, I'm long-winded to say that I don't really know, obviously, but I'm not married to the idea that, you know, that you have to work out. And people have reported getting better results from twice a week, and, and other people have said they get better results from once a week. But one of the things, you know, like going back to some of the people you've interviewed lately, and, and, and even if I may, your own statements, and I'll, I'll paraphrase from memory here, where you say, I feel my current workout is doing pretty good because I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm looking better. I like the way I look. And Brian Johnson was talking about people looking significantly better within 24 to 36 hours after one of his workouts. The thing is, I have, a, I have an issue with that. Um, my, my, I'm skeptical because whenever anyone says, um, you know, something like that anecdotally, I just, 
Okay, so well, in, well, in the context of what he was saying, I, I I couldn't find that compelling because it was anecdotal. But obviously, my own experience is more valuable to me. Yeah, but not well, to others necessarily. That makes sense. So, so the, one of the reasons why I'm in, I, I'm very excited to have access to a bod pod is that in the next year or so, I want to do some experimenting, and then basically with the bod pod not sit and look at a mirror or stand and look at a mirror and go, I think I'm, yeah. I think I look better. Right. Or, or the weights, I think the weights that you use in the time under load, I don't think that's actually a good measure because there's too many, uh, you know, it's so easy to spend less time in the hard parts of the rep and more time in the easy part or to brace more or to change your speed or, or whatnot. I don't think that's a good indicator. I think the only thing that's that's a good indicator is is something like a bod pod to say, am I actually uh, gaining muscle or am I not gaining muscle? If you can have something that can actually measure that, then you'll be able to gauge. I mean, one of the things that when when Ryan said, you know, that people can look different. From my body building experience, one of the things that I did realize and and as, as I had a diet coach as well, is you know when you get really lean in any given day, depending on your water retention alone, you can look really different in the mirror. If you're if you're holding water, bodybuilders call it, you know, if you're holding too much water, they say you're smooth. So you kind of <laughs> look big, your muscles look full, but there's no definition. And if you're not holding enough water, then they say you look flat. So you might look sort of defined, but you 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 look uh, well like crap. And so you know when the bodybuilding, they're trying to manipulate that by you know carbohydrates make you hold more water, whatever it is. And there's all different ways of doing it. Uh, sometimes really stupid, unhealthy ways of doing it. But the idea is to have just that. So. On any given day, I'll bet you there's days you look at yourself in the mirror and you're going, I'm, I look pretty darn good. And then a day later, you're looking at yourself and going, geez, what happened? I, I look horrible. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's, and it's I strange. think often, uh, often it, it, a lot of it has to do, especially if you're lean enough. Obviously, if you're not lean, uh, that's harder. To, but if you're lean, you can look very different from one day to the next, right? And even, you know, the guys we see in the, in the bodybuilding books, even, you know, the, the, the greats, the, the steroid guys and everything else, you got to remember that we're, we're even seeing them with, you know, photographers that are taking them in the best possible light and they're flexing and they're good at, they're good at posing and they got everything. You know, you, you, I always say even the guys, nobody can look like the guys on the magazine covers, even the guys on the magazine covers. Yeah, well said. You know what I mean. What uh, so. you've Richard, you've obviously got a ton of experience, and you you've read a lot, um, as you um, alluded to in in your blog blog article. What what do you see, or what do you think that most participants, I suppose those that are relatively new to high intensity training or young and naive, what do you think? What mistakes do you think they're making that you see? I would say, I mean, and, 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 I'll, and I'll preface this by saying I spend way more time in the mirror than I probably should admit in a public forum. But I would say that people worry uh, far too much about impressing other people because, you know, we talk about why do people want big muscles? And, you know, I, I think I forget who you were interviewing, but, you know, about impressing the opposite sex. I think you were on a conversation where you talked about you were talking about steroids. But nice. most of the time, guy, most of the time, guys are trying to impress other guys. Uh, strange as that may sound, right? Because they want to be known as, "Well, look at the pipes on that guy," right? As <laughs> as people should be thinking in terms, and I know this is really hard for a young person because when you're young, the idea of getting older is is like a distant thing that you can't even get your head around. But I think people should be thinking in terms of instead of how do I look good at the beach this summer, 
which is part of it. And by the way, if that's what motivates you and gets you to the gym and everything else, that's great. Vanity, I, I'm going to defend vanity because if it gets you there, great. But but keep it in perspective. The real important thing, you know, is am I going to be able to dance at my grandson's wedding? Am I going to need a walker uh, to go to the bathroom or need to be in a facility that that is going to um, have to cater to me and depend on other people and be a burden on other people because I've I've lost the ability, my functional ability. So that's the thing is people uh, get... And, and, and don't get me wrong, if, if I'm honest, vanity probably is the bigger motivator. You know, they say when you buy something, you buy emotionally and then you rationalize with reason. Well, you know, I probably I probably buy, quote unquote, fitness because of vanity, but I rationalize by knowing what it'll do for me. So even though I'm vain, that's why I don't do trap bar deadlifts anymore. And I don't do crazy things because... I want to be able to do this, you know, if I'm if I'm fortunate enough to still be around, I want to be able to do this, you know, like in my 60s and 70s and and beyond. What's your and, and what's wrong with uh, I want to be able to go to the bathroom without anybody helping me. Sorry to drop you there Richard. Um what's your what's your issue with trap bar deadlifts? Uh my issue with things like trap bar deadlifts, uh, barbell squats, and things like that, other than I think that over time you're you're compressing your spine. And I, I have to think that even if you don't have an acute injury, uh, you're probably going to have some wear and tear over time with that. Even though, you know, I would say that as far as an exercise that probably created stimulus more than anything I've ever done, which was trap bar deadlifts, uh, having had a, a, an unfortunate experience, my advice to people is you only have to get it wrong once. What happened? And, well, I was, I was actually using a very lightweight, using a stiff-legged deadlift, and I was doing a lightweight. And I had this great idea that I was going to put these four-by-fours under my feet so that I could get a better stretch. Uh, and that in itself wasn't a problem. The problem was, as I realized after, is that my two four by fours were not exactly four by four each. One was slightly higher than the other. So I put myself in a very compromised position. And if you've ever hurt your back, you know the feeling where you just feel that sudden twinge. It feels a little bit like an electric shock. And you know that, oh, this is going to hurt. And, you know, the next three or four days of your life are, are miserable. Now, luckily, I didn't do any actual disc damage or anything like that. But uh, I could have. And I think it remains a weak spot. That was about, you know, five, six years ago. And since that time, you know, I've tweaked it a couple times since. And I've come back. But one of the time was just, you know, picking up a T-shirt in the, in the, in the hallway that I left uh, hanging around. I picked it up as an afterthought after I'd already walked pot by it a little bit so that I had to bend forward and sideways to get it. Uh, and it was another interesting three days. So um, I just think that those exercises, you know, having said that, every time I go play hockey, I'm taking a risk too. But that's just a calculated risk that you know, the fun that I have when you go play basketball, obviously you could hurt yourself. But uh, and you're probably taking a wear and tear on your, your ankles and your knees to some degree. But my guess is that you've weighed the pros and cons and you probably say, I like playing basketball. And so Correct. you're doing it. <laughs> exactly. Whereas, whereas deadlifts, I don't know. I, I, I think I can stay fit without deadlifts. Um. So in your current current job you're a regional director for sun life financial is that correct i saw in your yes, signature I yeah i'm interested because you've uh, you mentioned in your blog um the issues with with sitting uh and being too st static for too long and obviously you've elaborated on that a little bit already in this this episode um but i'm very curious as to how you personally combat um sort of prolonged sitting because uh, I'm assuming a part of your job involves sitting at a computer, that type of thing. Well, I, I'm, I'm sitting now next to my stand-up desk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but typically, because uh, uh, I, I worked out this morning, as I said, with Blair, so sitting feels good right now. But um, uh, I have set up a stand-up desk uh, that I that I try to use when I can. I also try to get up uh, regularly. I, my Fitbit has a little alarm on it that, that buzzes every hour to just remind me to just get up and, you know, go for a little walk. That's a good idea. Um, so, you know, I just, I just think, uh, the more of that that you can do changing positions, often, uh, different things. I think I mentioned there's a book called, uh, standing in a seated world or something. You can, you can refer to, to the blog and whatnot, which mm -hmm. I, I found really interesting. I didn't know until after that this guy is a guy who coaches people in, apparently in CrossFit and things like that. I didn't know his background. I, I think the book is great. Uh, but he gives a whole bunch of how-tos, you know, everything from, you know, how do you deal with it if you're going to be in an airplane on a really long flight or if you have a job like a, somebody who's a truck driver or something that requires you to sit all the time and things like that, you know, how can you minimize the damage? You know, shoes, you know, what shoes to wear, particularly women who wear high heel shoes and, and things of that nature. So I just try to be conscious of, of that. And, you know, in the, in the book, that first book, Aerobics, Kenneth Cooper, you might remember that he talked about a study about how um, the, the bus drivers had more heart disease than the guys who went around collecting the tickets on the double-decker buses. Remember that? Um, and, I, sorry, go on, yeah. And from that, he extrapolated that, you know, that was proof that everybody should be running marathons, which was a huge leap. I, I speculate that it might simply be not that everybody should be running marathons, but that they shouldn't be sitting down all day. Because the guy who was collecting the tickets wasn't running marathons. He just wasn't sitting down all day as the bus driver was. Was it there I, a selection I, bias? Oh, there Oh, absolutely. I yeah. mean, that's just speculation on my part. But, you know, there's a there, – and I don't know, people are saying sitting is the new smoking. I don't know if that's true or it's just something that sounds trendy. But I do think it makes sense to me, you know, it, it seems intuitively to be logical that we weren't created to sit all day long over yeah. a desk. And that there is there are consequences to that. But I don't think that being active – means going out and running marathons. I think that would be the prime example of the pendulum swinging all the way over to yeah. the other side. Just get up and move around regularly. What's your, when you are sitting and working, if you're not standing, what's your, what posture do you uh, assume when you do that? Probably a bad one. I won't, I won't pretend to, uh, uh, this, something, this is something that's pretty recent that I've, become to be aware of and mm. starting to make adjustments to so very much a work in progress uh as far as as far as that goes i, I know that I, I would recommend chris master john has one of his do you know his podcast too chris master john I, I i know of him and um i've seen a few youtube videos with him i haven't listened to his podcast i may have even reached out to him i've reached out to a lot of people so i, I can't always recall um but yeah he's, he's obviously very well known and well respected and, and so he has one of his podcasts where he talks about where he'll spend some of his time uh standing some of his time where he's kneeling and he puts a cushion uh uh you know on his uh, calves and then he sits back on the cushion Oh. And and so he, he has different sitting positions and some standing positions based on the idea. And it makes sense that, you know, sitting all day is no good, but standing all day is also no good. Yeah. Right. And so what I have next to my stand up desk or behind the stand up desk is I have a, a chair turned backwards and I have the uh, little footstool, you know, that you have on it so that I have one foot up. But I'm also often I'm not actually just standing. I'm leaning back on the chair itself so i'm not putting all my weight on a chair but i'm still in a relatively upright position if you can if you can visualize I that can, where yeah. you're standing and and you're just uh basically got your butt on the back of the chair but you're still able to reach your keyboard that you're using on your stand-up desk and then and you know the the guy who wrote that book uh, is telling anybody he says 
the, the best position is the next one, meaning, uh, you know, shift a lot. As you get in one position and that one gets uncomfortable, change. You know, if you got one foot up and that gets uncomfortable, put the other foot up. You know, and if you've been standing for a while, you know, lean back against the back of the chair or, or whatever. And that just, that makes, that, that again, seems to be intu- intuitively logical to me. Yeah, I agree. One thing I find challenging is if I'm um, really involved in a piece of work, um, I can sometimes sit in the same position, which isn't always the best posture, for two to three hours solid um, when I'm so engrossed. And it's trying to get that balance of, okay, well, you know, I need to probably be moving or changing positions at least hourly. um, But also, I still want to generate that kind of output. You know, I still want to have those that kind yeah. of productivity. So it's trying to get that balance is always a bit of a challenge, I think. Yeah. Mm. And, and I play guitar as well. And that can be one where you have to be very careful too, because you not mm. only are sitting or whatever, but you also have your neck a certain way, always the same way. And you're holding one arm exactly the same way and the other arm exactly the same way. And it's not the same. So, yeah. and, and I know that musicians often have uh, problems uh, because, of course, in order to be a good musician, you have to spend hours of practice. So they often uh, have it, various issues with neck and back and things like that. Just uh, I wanted to move on to some kind of I call these kind of bonus questions. They're relatively rapid fire, but the answers don't have to be rapid. So you can give me a long answer if you want to. Um, but just wondered, what have you changed your mind about in the last year with regards to exercise? Um, well, I don't know the, the, the time frame. I think uh, some of the things I remember that Arthur Jones would say, you know, that, you know, a, a full body Nautilus workout will take care of everything, cardiovascular, flexibility, uh, everything. I, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, and he also would say, you know, the flexibility part would say, you know, because you're going to do it in the fullest range of motion possible. Um, I don't think, and, and I think you've interviewed Bill, Bill Desimon. Yep. Uh, I don't. I think a full range of motion uh, can be a bad thing, uh, and and so I don't think that's necessarily that full range of motion is always better. Um, I also uh, think that you probably do need to do some flexibility work in between workouts. Uh, gentle, not ballistic things and whatnot, uh, to be be able to do that. Um, I think failure is a misunderstood thing. The idea of going to failure, and even in 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 fairness to Arthur and others, he he never said. My understanding is he never said that failure was a requirement. It's just that it's the it's the only way you can measure, because you know how do you measure. 80% failure, 90% failure. If you go to failure, you know you've done everything you can. Although he did concede that you could get results without necessarily going to failure, but how could you measure it? Um, but but I think if, if you think about it, he originally also thought that rotary movements would be better than compound movements because they would isolate the muscle better. But in fact, compound movements, most people I think would agree are more productive than isolation movements because they engage more muscle. But if you think about any compound movement, you're, the muscle, like in a chest press or, or a leg press, um, you know, your, your quadriceps will likely, depending on the machine, your quadriceps will probably uh, fail long before your gluteus maxima, maximus has failed, and yet you're still getting benefit to both. Right. I mean, when you're doing chest press, your triceps fail before your pecs, but you're still getting benefit. So, you know, I think that and, and failure is such a, a, in my opinion, an ambiguous term is if I pick a weight that I can't lift at all, I can just do a static and I failed in three seconds. Uh, you know, if I do a weight that I can do 50 reps and I fail on the 51st rep, that's failure. And, and five reps, I, I know that the sequential uh, recruitment of fibers, if you get the right thing, that makes sense to me. But being able to pinpoint which one is right or which one is not, I think is, is uh, 
is is tough. And I and I think Doug McGuff says, you know, it's pretty hard to do. And you know, you you know all the different things where you do a one rep max and then use eighty percent and see how far you get, and that's your ideal rep range and things like that. And I, I think there's probably something to that, but I think it's probably a good idea. Like when I talk about freestyling, uh, I don't even know. Like if you said today what weight are you using on the machines you're using, I'd say I don't know. Um, I'll go to the machine, and I don't track. I have no charts. I have nothing. I'll go to the machine. I'll look at it, and I go, eh, let's, put, let's add a few plates and do lower reps today or – you know, I'm doing this one fifth. Let's let's because I'm going to do something else. Let's just do do lower reps and everything. So that way, there you're going up and down the spectrum, if you will. I think is the way that Doug McGuff puts it about which fibers you might recruit or not recruit. So I think sometimes low reps is good, high reps is is good. And, and then at the end, even though I want to prove John Little wrong, I know that there is not going to be a you know what I'd like to do by when I say prove him wrong is, you know, if next year I put on two pounds of muscle or even a pound, and a pound, I'll be ecstatic. I don't think there's any magic pill. When I say prove them wrong, I don't think there's going to be something I'm going to take or do that I'm going to put on 10 pounds of muscle. If so, I'm, I'm, I'm going to call you up and make sure we get back, get me back on the podcast. <laughs> uh, I think he's going to get mad. Uh, you keep selling you're going to prove him wrong. <laughs> well, I, th- I think you would appreciate where I'm coming from is, I, I, I'm not saying he is wrong. I'm just saying that it's, I think it's a useful thing for all of us to try to prove it wrong. Again, as long as we're not doing stupid stuff in the process, right? Yeah, and I think it, it, going back to your point before, like you can't be obsessed about it. Like if you're, I think the thing. I mean, John, this is just my interpretation. John might disagree, but I think you know you look at someone like Doug. Doug seems really still very passionate about his workouts, uh, and he says he says he is. And with John, I feel like he's he is he still trains because he appreciates the benefits um, and. and Obviously, he, I'm sure he, he does enjoy his workouts, but he's not, he's not very as passionate about it. And I guess part of that is, is he just doesn't think it's, there's much point, I guess, in, in playing around with, you know, the details so much. And he's not as interested in that because he, I guess he just doesn't believe the gains are worthwhile. And he well, could be and right. I, and, and, and I mean, it could be make the argument. So I'd say, if I gain a pound of muscle next year, I'd be ecstatic. Somebody could very well ask, why? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, why, do, why would you care about that? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, I'm asking myself that question as I'm saying it. But, I mean, I think if you, if you, if you play guitar, you want to get better at playing guitar. If you play hockey, you want to get better at playing hockey. I could turn around. You want to get better at basketball. Even though, you know, even if you don't get better, you're still going to have fun. But hey, you want to get better, right? And you, you know, you and I both know if we, if you haven't been in the NBA by now, you're not going to the NBA. Sadly, and, right? So, but nevertheless, if you enjoy something, you're passionate about it, you're always going to try to improve. I think. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think there's there's definitely value in um, wanting to improve, and that, as as you were saying earlier, as a means to, if only to motivate you to train or to be excited and enjoy your workouts. Um, interested to know what health and fitness book have you gifted or recommended the most? Uh, probably Body by Science. Uh... Yeah, I've gifted, I, I have gifted that one to several people. I, I like Doug. Uh, what I like, I mean, Doug is obviously very knowledgeable and whatnot, but, but what I really give him the most credit for is I think he's a great ambassador for HIT and sensible exercise. I think there are too many people, and maybe this is the legacy of Arthur Jones, I see sometimes people that my perception is, that they're sort of Arthur Jones wannabes. And Arthur Jones was brilliant, but let's face it, he was very abrasive yeah. and, and and whatnot. And I see a lot of other people, and Doug never has this, you know, I'm right, I know everything, I have the answers, and if you don't agree with me, you're an idiot. Whereas, unfortunately, I see too much of that 
in the hit community, in my opinion. Uh, everybody sort of seems to think that they have the answers. I, I like, uh, one of the things I like that when Doug says is he says, these are things I suspect, but I can't prove. Right? I think he's just a great ambassador uh, for things. He, he, he tells you what he believes, but he also, you know, is, is tells you when he's not sure about things. And, and I just think it's really important to still keep an open mind that as much as what we think we know, somebody may come along and turn it all upside down on us and, and realize that, oh, my God, all this time, like, you know, maybe we've been working out once a week, the greater frequency. Geez, have we been holding back? Maybe we should have been working out three times a week all, all the way through. Mm. <laughs> I think you I think you have to remain open. And I think to some extent, Arthur Jones used to uh, do that. To some extent, it was part of his marketing. But I mean, the reason they brought Ellington Darden in, from what I've heard, is that they needed a guy who was a better ambassador because he was, uh, Jones was a genius, but he was horrible in front of a crowd, right? I mean, he wouldn't just insult people. He wasn't above death threats. Right. He's been known to make death threats to people and things like that. Wow. So uh, which, you know, was, was part of his infamy, if you will. Right. Because, you know, he would say these great things like, you know, I, I'm going to improve the fitness level of of uh, the country by putting all the professional sports coaches in an airplane and flying it into the side of a cliff. And yeah, things that's, like that. So that's and, surprise and also, me. Yeah, I mean, he said some pretty sensational things, which, of course, attributed. And I think to some extent that was for shock effect and sort of added to his legend and added to him selling a lot of Nautilus machines. Yeah. Um, now, Richard, really, uh, really appreciate you going into that. I'm going to need to to wrap up. What's the, okay. what's the best way for people to find out more about you and contact you if they have any questions? Uh. I, they, they can look me up on Facebook, and mm -hmm. I have a, a page on Facebook, which is terrible. I'm going to – I'll have to email it to you. It's called, I think it's called Being the Hero of Your Life. Yeah, Being the Hero of Your Own Life. And uh, I'm an Ayn Rand uh, fan, so that's part of that. And fitness is part of that. And, you know, uh, and, and so I try to write a blog, and I want to write a little bit more of that. And, of course, when this comes out, I'll, I'll be posting it there. But. Excellent. By all means, Facebook or on, on that Facebook page, uh, they'll be able to also link to my actual blog, which I don't contribute to as often as I can, but I have over the last five, six years. So if anybody by chance is interested in reading my thoughts, they're more than welcome to do so. Appreciate that. And uh, obviously everything you've you've mentioned there in terms of your contact details and Facebook page, et cetera, will be in the show notes um, for people to to see. Uh, and obviously for those listening, if you want to, if you have any questions for Richard, um, if you do want to drop those in the, uh, the comments on the blog post, I will politely ask Richard to respond when he has some time. Um, and to find the show notes for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com to get your free ebook with six interview transcripts of some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill Day Simone, on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. These transcripts are not verbatim, deliberately. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results. To get your ebook, head on over to Corp warrior.com that's c-o-r-p warrior.com and enter your email address then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link once you click the link you'll be instantly redirected to a pdf version of the transcripts